<laughs> dark. No, that, that's fine. Just some of the pictures are ended up a little dark. It's so <laughs> Had lunch. Something else. Um, about how long do you think this will be? Uh, maybe 15 or 20. Perfect. Okay, there you go. Okay, um, so today I'll be presenting on a technique, microtomography, uh, and also a journal article uh, that uses microtomography to measure uh, porosity, density, and compaction in woven carbon fiber composites. It's a very recent paper, just came out um, maybe about four months ago or so. Mm. Um, so let's start with what is microtomography. Uh, it's a non-destructive technique that uses x-ray radiation uh, that essentially allows you to make a full three-dimensional reconstruction of the entire sample all the way through. And uh, once you have that, you can then take slices and look at individual slices in any direction, uh, in any depth, and any thickness of your sample. Uh, it's also known as x-ray tomography, uh, industrial computed tomography, industrial com as uh, opposed to medical uh, CT. Um, and it's also called micro CT uh, because it has much higher resolution than medical CT. It uses essentially the same technology, uh, like if you go to the hospital and get a CT scan, um, it uses more or less exactly the same technology. Uh, so if you go get a CT scan, what you end up with is a series of images that are slices of your body, essentially. You can pick, all sorts of, pick out all sorts of great things like the liver and the kidneys and the spine. Um, and this technique is really used within the medical industry uh, to identify tumors or broken bones or other things like that uh, where you actually need to see into the depth of, of the person. Um, so how does it work? We have an x-ray source here. Uh, you shine x-rays on your sample and then you have the detector. And for the sample I've just chosen a manifold block uh, because you might be interested in you know, a given cross-section or to make sure that the holes are bored exactly right. Um, and then all you have to do is rotate the sample. Uh, so every time you take um, an image like this, uh, you end up with what's called a shadow. And that shadow um, is essentially the sum of the x-rays that I'll make it all the way through your sample and reach the detector. Um, so by rotating it, we take a whole series of shadows. Uh, depending on your algorithm, maybe you only have to rotate 180 degrees, maybe you have to go all 360 degrees. Uh, but then you can use an algorithm uh, to take these shadows and then recreate the three-dimensional uh, the, the three uh, structure of your sample. So resolution is based primarily on detector size and density. Uh, how many um, sensors do you have in your detector? How close are they together? Uh, it's also limited by sample size. Um, as you'll see in the paper that I'm about to present, they use the same detector, and depending on sample size, they got either 2 microns per pixel or 7 microns per pixel. Um, it's also based on software limitations. Um, certain types of software uh, that do micro CT, uh, they can only handle images up to maybe 4,000 by 2,000 pixels or something like that. Uh, and so even if you have a very small sample size, you might be only able to get a certain resolution based on the size of the picture that you can get. Uh, just so you know, typical resolutions for a medical CT scan, it's about one millimeter. Um, they also have high resolution CT scans for if they want to focus and you know, specifically image a tumor or something very small, um, and those can be 100 microns. Uh, micro CT, depending on your system, depending on your sample size, it can reach uh, resolutions as low as half a micron, typical maybe five or 10 microns. Um, so in medical CT, it's sort of hard to rotate the sample that is a person without moving. So for this, uh, they actually take the x-ray source and the detectors and rotate it around the person. Um, for industrial CT, uh, since your sample is small and fixed, it's just a lot easier to rotate your sample. Um, here's just a simple example. Oh, the picture didn't come out so well. Um, here's a simple example. If you start with a rectilinear prism, uh, these are some shadows that you might end up with. And so you can see, depending on your different angles, um, you can see uh, what the sample, what, what the shadow might look like. And from this data, you can then recreate the full 3D uh, uh, structure. Uh, so as far as reconstruction goes, um, there's something called the radon transform. It has nothing to do with the element. It's named after a man named Johann Radon who uh, developed it. It's similar to the Fourier transform. Um, so if we take our original image here, um, use uh, maybe a sensor down here and an x-ray source up here and rotate that around, what we'll end up with is this image over here, which is called a sinogram. 
So this plots the uh, one-dimensional shadows. Since we're only working two dimensions here, each shadow will be one-dimensional. It plots the shadows uh, versus the angle of rotation here. So we have increasing angle of rotation as we go down here, and then this is the one-dimensional shadow. And so then we can use the radon transform uh, to reconstruct the original image. Um, and when we do this in three dimensions, not only can we reconstruct the original image, uh, but we can also isolate individual slices through something. Uh, there are a few uh, issues with the reconstruction. Uh, one of them is based on attenuation. Uh, this phenomenon is called beam hardening. Uh, so here we have a sphere of constant density. Um, and you can see quite clearly that it's much brighter on the outside than it is at the center, even though it's exactly the same structure. Uh, this has to do with the fact that the X-ray energy uh, is partially absorbed by any sample. Um, and so the energy reaching the center will be lower than the energy reaching an edge. And when you rotate it, uh, you end up with essentially a, a very bright edge and a dark center. Um, this can be removed using uh, software algorithms. Uh, there are some other artifacts that you'll see. Uh, rings, which you'll actually see in some of the samples uh, I'll be describing later. Uh, rings have to do with the fact that maybe one particular pixel in your detector gets a little bit miscalibrated, or maybe it's temperature sensitive or something like that. Um, and so if that one pixel is off, it'll show up as a vertical line on your sinogram. When you do the radon transform and end up the original image, it shows up as a circle or concentric rings. Uh, there are also surface effect artifacts. Uh, these are due to reflection, refraction, or diffraction of the x-rays around the edges of your sample. Uh, so if you have you know, a lot of sharp edges, or maybe, um, may maybe a little bit of your x-ray will be diffracted in a different direction, and that can show up as an artifact. And also partial volume artifacts. Partial volume artifacts um, show up because uh, your resolution is limited. And so a given pixel may actually be made up of a couple different materials, especially if it shows up as an interface. Uh, so it's partial volume artifacts uh, that will take uh, water in your actual sample that are hard lines and turn those into sort of fuzzy lines um, just due to the limited resolution. Uh, so here I'll be showing a series of uh, shadows. This is a webcam that's of the image. Um, so these are the shadows. This is what the x-ray detector is actually seeing. And you can clearly see screws over here. Uh, these are the lenses. Uh, the detector will show up right here. There it is. Um, so after you've taken all, the, all this data um, and run it through your algorithm, you can actually isolate individual slices throughout the webcam. And you can, I mean, I'm just using webcam as, as an example. And you can see that uh, the screws and some of the resistors and chips, um, since they're metallic, uh, they absorb a lot more of the x-rays, so they show up as dark spots, as opposed to the plastic housing uh, permits uh, most of the x-ray to go through, and so it shows up as mostly transparent. Uh, so now I'll be presenting a paper. Uh, the paper is titled Measuring the Impregnation of an Out of Autoclave Prepreg by Micro CT. Um, it came out of McGill University, which is in Montreal. As I said, it was published just four months ago. Uh, so there's a lot of motivation. The main motivation for um, studying out of autoclave uh, carbon fiber composites is for the aerospace industry. In particular, um, commercial airlines are forecast to need at least 25,000 new planes over the next 20 years. This is in order to replace an aging fleet and also just increase efficiency uh, by which we can transport people around the world. Uh, the problem is that current technologies don't actually allow for this number of planes to be built over the next 20 years, so we need to develop new technologies uh, to meet this demand. Uh, traditional carbon fiber composites are made using a large pressor, pressure vessel called an autoclave. Um, this produces high quality uh, composite parts. However, there are a few limitations, uh, including a very high capital cost, high operating cost uh, associated with the compressed nitrogen gas, and they're also size limiting. Uh, it, right now, they don't make autoclaves big enough to make an entire airplane wing or an entire fuselage. Uh, so we're studying out of autoclave processing. There are several different types, uh, vacuum-assisted resin transfer molding, pultrusion, and today I'll be discussing uh, vacuum bag only processing. Uh, this is great because it has a very low cost. All you need is essentially a tool, uh, some release films, and a vacuum bag and a vacuum pump. 
uh, there's in theory no size limitation. You could make an entire airplane wing. Uh, however, porosity is still a problem at this point. Uh, so there are uh, many carbon fiber uh, composite companies that are coming out with new resins uh, that are supposed to work better at low temperatures and at low pressures. Uh, that's the thing about vacuum bag only, is you're limited to a one pressure, a one atmosphere pressure difference. Uh, with an autoclave, you can pressurize it up to six or seven atmospheres, which can completely uh, collapse any voids that may have formed. In vacuum bag only, uh, those voids can't be collapsed by that pressure. Uh, so in this paper, uh, they used what's called a five harness satin weave. Um, so that's shown here. Essentially, each uh, carbon fiber toe goes over four <coughs> and under one. Um, you can see that works for uh, both the cross and the longitudinal ones. Uh, they use 6K carbon fiber toes, so each toe is made up of 6,000 individual carbon fibers. Uh, the resin they use is MTM 45-1 from the Advanced Composites Group uh, in Britain. And uh, for these samples, uh, they all had four layers, except for sample number 10, which had eight layers. Um, and they were oriented uh, at zero degrees and 90 degrees for beating. Uh, this is their uh, cured temperature profile. Uh, so at the very beginning, uh, they just held it at constant vacuum at room temperature for one hour. Uh, then they had a ramp up at two degrees C per minute. Uh, and then uh, once they reached 85 C, they held that for 90 minutes. Uh, 10 samples were taken. Uh, sample number one experienced no vacuum and no heat, so that's just as it was laid up. Uh, samples two through five experienced vacuum for different times, uh, but no heat. Sample six was partially uh, part of the way up the ramp, and seven, eight, nine, and ten um, were after the uh, after the composite reached the soak temperature. Uh, so for these images, uh, they used a resolution of seven microns per pixel. Um, as you can see, the sample size is 10 or 15 um, millimeters uh, and you know, maybe 3 or 4 millimeters thick. Uh, so this is uh, lambda 1, which has experienced no vacuum, no heat, nothing like that. And you can see huge areas of voids. Here, for example, here's another one, here's another one. Um, and then here they focused on one particular toe, which as you can see is dry. Um, this image, this uh, inset right here, that's when they used thresholding. Um, we'll talk about that later. Thre they used thresholding to isolate the, the dry carbon fiber toes as compared with the areas that were resin rich. Uh, so here's lambda five, which experienced vacuum for one hour, uh, but had no heat applied. And already you can see a big uh, difference. Um, a, a lot of the largest voids are gone. You know, obviously there are still some large ones here, there, and there. Uh, but most of the largest voids are gone. Uh, the toes are still completely dry on the inside, pretty much, as, as you can see uh, from this inset. Uh, so here's laminate seven. Uh, this is shortly after it reached the soak time. Uh, just a side note, you can see some of these ring artifacts that I was mentioning here. They don't show up so well on the projection, but on the screen you can see them. Um, as I said before, that's related to a, a sensor issue that then gets transformed into rings uh, after you do the Renault transform. Um, so th this one experienced uh, vacuum and heat. Um, most of the voids are gone, as you can see. However, the resin is not completely um, impregnated all the toes, and you can still see uh, areas that have dry carbon fiber toes. And here's uh, sample nine, which has been at the soak temperature for about 20 minutes or so. Uh, again, you can see rings on this sample. Uh, but almost all the carbon fiber toes are completely impregnated with resin. Maybe there's a little bit here, maybe a little bit over here that's still dry. Um, but this shows that even shortly after reaching the soak time, um, the resin is completely impregnated, uh, the, the composite. Uh, they also ran uh, a couple high res higher resolution images. Uh, so this is lambda 5 again. Uh, it experienced vacuum, but no heat. Uh, this is a smaller sample size, but it's much higher resolution, two microns per pixel. Um, and so this allows you to see into the carbon fiber toes more clearly and with higher resolution. And here's lambda 10. Again, this is the high resolution, uh, two microns per pixel. Lambda 10 was taken at the very end of the cure cycle, so it experienced 90 minutes at the soak temperature. 
Uh, so we can see right here there's one macro void. Um, that's, uh, that's due to the fact that some air got trapped between layers and was not able to escape uh, after the resin started flowing. Uh, what we do notice, uh, here they've zoomed in on one particular toe here, that all the carbon toes are fully impregnated with the resin. Um, and, and we don't see any voids within the toes. That's because, uh, you know, the, as, as long as the toes are dry, air can still flow out through the length of the toes. And since the toes run completely from end to end of the composite, air bubbles can escape and are no longer trapped. Uh, what we see here is that an air bubble got trapped between the layers and had no dry breather path uh, to, it, to escape. Uh, so here's some 3D visualizations. Um, th this shows essentially porosity, uh, a three-dimensional representation of porosity. So for laminate one, as laid up, you can see these large, flat, square-ish um, voids. And this is due to the fact that, you know, as laid up, there's been no compacting pressure. So these voids are almost entirely between adjacent layers of the composite. Uh, when we go over here to sample five, um, there's been some compaction. You see that most of the large square ones are gone. What's left, though, are still some elongated ones. Uh, here, here, for example. Uh, that's due to the weave pattern and the fact that you know there's been uh, compaction, but there hasn't been any resin flow at this point since the resin is still uh, very, very viscous. Um, once we get up to laminate nine, though, uh, again, this one experienced the soak temperature rolling for about 20 minutes. Uh, what we're left with is only these sort of bulbous, more or less spherical voids. These are the ones I discussed a moment ago that are trapped between the layers. All the, uh, all the voids that would be inside of a toe or within a layer, those have already escaped, and we're left with just these ones that are trapped. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, they took um, some of these images and used thresholding to find the dry areas versus the resin-rich areas. Uh, the dry areas are in black, the resin ridge is in white. And they went through and did this manually, actually. Um, and here we have a plot for the different samples of uh, dry toe area uh, compared to the processing. So as we can see, um, throughout the vacuum only uh, period, there's a slight decrease in dry toe area, but really not much since the resin is so viscous. Uh, but once we've raised the temperature, the resin viscosity uh, drops sharply, and so we can see that the resin, you know, even by 110 minutes in, uh, the resin is completely uh, wet all the carbon fiber toes. Um, they also uh, found porosity uh, versus uh, time. So one thing they omitted is the data point of period zero, where it says right here, 16.9% porosity, so that would be about there or so. Uh, that with just vacuum, um, you can reduce porosity down to about three and a half percent uh, through vacuum alone. With the addition of heat um, and the resin impregnation, it reaches a minimum porosity at you know about 110 minutes. This is just shortly after it reaches the cure temperature here. And then between 110 minutes and 180 minutes, there really isn't any significant uh, decrease in porosity. Uh, so a few conclusions. Uh, Micro-CT has been demonstrated to be a very powerful imaging tool, uh, allowing for a huge amount of data to be uh, created with very little work. It um, allows for measurement and visualization of resin impregnation and flow, void formation, and the most important thing in my opinion, the microstructural analysis. And also, uh, what's most surprising to me is that the resin impregnation is complete shortly after reaching the cure temperature. This is when the resin has reached its lowest viscosity. Shortly after that, it is actually impregnated all the carbon fiber toes, uh, and holding it for longer periods of time may not be as effective as we previously thought. Uh, this concludes my presentation, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have.